action. Thought of a lot of things, um, was one of the first to complain and argue against the um, British taxes, was the surveyor, pretty much started the um, French and, and Indian War. So he was kind of a leader by doing things, especially as he becomes president, where a lot of the things he did now make up the United States presidency. He was so well respected and thought of, they let him govern by precedent. Where Jefferson was more of the thinker, a little more subtle. He wasn't the so much man of action. It was his written word and his policies that define his leadership as he doubles the size of the country with one stroke of, of the pen. Washington and Jefferson, um, while it's hard to go first, it's some kind, sometimes easy because you have, you're compared to no one. I tell my students in class, if you're nervous, go first. All right? You set the tone. Everyone else has to react to, to what you do. So they do a lot of important things, the founding of the country, making sure it's cemented is outstanding. But the guy, I think, that has the toughest job of them all will be President Lincoln. And I say that in, in class, I, you know, and you'll see the picture in a few minutes, that he was probably the loneliest president that we had. As right when he comes into office, I call it the worst day ever, nothing is going right. He's got monumental problems, and there's no one to help him. There is no support for him. So he has this incredible job, and he says it, in his first inaugural address, even in his campaign speeches, my job is to preserve the Union. That's what I am doing. I've got to keep this country together. So if you look at where he was born in Hardin County, Kentucky, if you look at the original North Carolina charter, Hardin County, Kentucky was part of the original state of North Carolina. So if we really wanted to argue, we could really upset Kentucky and say Lincoln was North Carolinian. I don't know how far we would get with that, but um, we would um, you know, give it a shot. His mom dies when he's very young. And he is one of our presidents who is pretty much almost single-handedly self-educated. He pretty much taught himself everything, how to read, how to write, and bizarrely, he is the only American president to hold a patent. I think Jefferson invented all kinds of stuff. Washington was doing stuff. But he invented a little gizmo called the cricket from his days working on the Ohio River to kind of, it's like a jack that will, you could crank it up and lift a heavily loaded barge over a shallow part of, of the river. So it is still in, in the patent office. So very smart guy. As a young boy, he hated physical labor, just couldn't stand it. When his dad would look for him, he said he was always like reading, ciphering, scribbling, doing something instead of the chores around the house that he was supposed to. But as he gets older, like 15, 16, he developed what is described as a tireless work ethic. And he's that tall, kind of lanky, you know, giraffe-looking guy but in his youth, he was a great wrestler, and he was also known as the guy, if you were being bullied, you went and got Lincoln. I guess he was a very fierce um, brawler, and he said in anything that was a contest, whether it was speaking or writing or like a game of checkers, he was that ultra-competitive guy that wouldn't quit no matter what and wasn't satisfied until they won. It's like my mother-in-law, you know, watching her play games when my kids were young, like she was creating rules. I'm like, Jan, all right? It's like Scrabble, or not Scrabble, it's like, sorry, you can't, like, just make up rules so you can beat a three-year-old. Well, I don't like to lose. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Um, he was known to suffer from what is known as the melancholy. Today, that is clinical depression, and I think him dealing with that depression and everything that he has to go through makes his story and his decisions um, even that much more um, impressive. So um, traveling as a mailman and then later working as a circuit court judge, he gets the nickname Honest Dave.
Because if you asked him, he always gave you the honest answer and a you know, very well thought out spoken ruling. Um, he dabbles in politics all the way back to the 1830s, usually campaigning for friends of his or attached to his law office. In one of these um, oh, campaigns, he actually gets into, it's hard to imagine President Lincoln, he gets into a legit barroom brawl with a nemesis of his named Stephen Douglas. Now they will be old enemies, Lincoln 6'4", Stephen Douglas was like 5'2", and in the alleyway behind the bar, Douglas was reported to be biting Lincoln's leg, so he stepped on him, all right? And that'll kind of symbolize their relationship um, um, forever. Um, so, you know, he doesn't really become prime time until the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 um, is written. And it was written by Stephen Douglas. And so this is right now six years before the Civil War is starting. And what the Kansas-Nebraska Act did, it was territory that was supposed to be off limits to slavery. It was above the so-called 3630 line, the Missouri Compromise line. But as we were expanding farther and farther westward, the Transcontinental Railroad was being built. Stephen Douglas owned a lot of land in the territory. He was already wealthy, but he would get even more money if Kansas and Nebraska became states. He would then route the railroad, because he was in charge of the Senate Committee on Transportation, it's a little corrupt, steer it through his property. But they had to become states first. Stephen Douglas also wants to become a president, so he says, Kansas and Nebraska can vote to be states, and they should also be able to vote whether they want to be slave or free. And people are like, no, 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 no. There are already free states. You can't make that happen. Lincoln, living in Illinois, speaks out against that. And right away, he puts a target on his back um, from Stephen Douglas. The two men just don't really like each other. And so we get to the Republican convention in Chicago. Um, and Lincoln gives a, a or no, it's a, a race, excuse me, a senatorial race in Illinois. And Lincoln gives what's one of his more understated speeches where people ask him about slavery. And he would say, well, I understand constitutionally that it is legal, but I hope it doesn't spread. I know it's legal, nothing I can do about that, but I would really like to prevent it from, prevent it from spreading. And he's asked, all right, well, you know, what do you think this is going to do to the country? Do you think it will dissolve and separate the country? And he says, no. Um, it was funny, we were talking about the Duke Carolina game last week, and all those house, house divided like license plates or, or you know, mailbox coverings or, or whatever. And he said, no. He goes, the United States will become either all free or all slave. A house divided against itself is going to fail. I believe we're going to be one way or the other. We can't be both. And that phrase there kind of outlines his thinking as he enters the presidency in what I will call the worst day ever um, in a second. That is the job that he has, all of his decisions that he will make in the ultimate leadership role will be to keep the union together. That very same year, he gets engaged in seven debates with his arch nemesis, Stephen Douglas. And it's where we get the term stump speeches, talking about the um, debate, where you would literally go to a group of people and jump up on a stump and begin to give your, your, your speech. And the two men are just so drastically opposite. It's, it's hysterical. Stephen Douglas was very wealthy. He had his nice Brooks Brothers, you know, navy blue pinstripe power suit with his gold watch. And he would come out and he would use fancy, like, you know, used car salesman language. And he would really sling it. The people whipped into a frenzy. And he just looked nice. He looked like a senator should. And then Lincoln shows up. And he's... 
looks like he got a, you know, a suit off of Goodwill, as you know, as you know, his arms were too long and it was a little bit too tight and his shirt would be untucked and looked like he was just a hobo that just, you know, rolled out of a cardboard box somewhere. And he starts um, talking. And when people listen to him, they're like, God, he spoke kind of real slow and he kind of moved a little bit like Frankenstein and he goes like this. But when he talked, he talked the language of the uh, people. Um, Stephen Douglas is up there saying, you know, you've got to diversify your portfolio. You want to have some mutual funds and some stocks here and bury some gold in the backyard. And you want to look for the future. People like diversifying stocks. Like, I got like cows and chickens. That's my stock. Like, what are you talking about? And Lincoln would come out and say, well, let me put it to you this way, you know. When you go to the hen house on a real windy, slippery morning, you might want to take two baskets with you and you put half the eggs in one basket and half in the other. So that way if you fall, you plan for the future, you have a nest egg that is safe in the other hand. And people are like, oh, man, I get that. Like eggs, chickens, two baskets, not one, slippery cold morning. And he talked about growing different type of crops and, and things that they could relate to when it talks about um, diversification and and you know, spreading things out and planning ahead. And Douglas was going like, oh my God. He looked at the crowd and everyone's going like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, uh-huh, I get that. And this is the growing state of Illinois. Douglas was picked to be the clear and away winner, and he barely wins. And this is how you know that you're good. Stephen Douglas hated Abraham Lincoln, not only because they were old enemies, because they got into that bar fight back in 1832. But Stephen Douglas wanted to marry Mary Todd Lincoln. He was courting her at first. All right. Her dad wanted Mary Todd to marry Stephen Douglas. He was rich. He was wealthy. This Lincoln kid's a poor farmer from a cabin somewhere in Kentucky. Like, what, what, what is in Kentucky? Like, you know, all right. Kentucky Derby School, better than that, like moonshine, like what else do we have? I don't even know. If you're from Kentucky, just go with that. <laughs> tobacco. All right, yeah, tobacco, uh, you know, Louisville, Muhammad Ali, I'm, I'm running out of things. What's that? There's a lot of money in Kentucky. I'm sure there might be. There's moonshine and marijuana. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> there you go, there you go. So, um, uh, who is this, this knucklehead? But for some reason, Mary Todd chooses Abraham, and Stephen Douglas never forgets that. But he says, he's like, this man Lincoln is going to be a force to be reckoned with. With his dry wit and catchy phrases, he is honest as he is smart. I would hate to have to run against him again. This is his deadly enemy. And Lincoln keeps a record of all the scrapbook, of all the newspaper presses releases about what he did right and what he did wrong. And he turns it into a manual. So the next time he was going to run for election, he was going to have something to, to look back on. Where did I go wrong? What did I do right? Let's form a new game plan. So in Chicago in May of 1860, he goes to the Republican Convention. And the Democrats held theirs at first in South Carolina, in Charleston, and half the delegates walked out because the Democratic Party would not adopt a platform to protect slave owners. So they leave, and they meet again three months later in Baltimore, and they're having the same issue. And the Southern Democrats will walk out, and maybe they'll go to the aquarium, or they'll go over to Fort McHenry or do something, and they come back, and they find out that the Northern Democrats had, in their absence, nominated Stephen Douglas to be the Democratic candidate for president. And the Southern Democrats say, oh, no, we weren't there. This is not going to happen. So they nominate a guy, one of their members, a guy named John Breckinridge. So there's two Democratic candidates for president. Lincoln's out in Chicago, and the Republicans picked Chicago because it was the frontier. is where America was moving. Move away from the old East Coast establishment and get out to where the real people are. And while there, there were three guys 
who are supposed to be front runners to, um, to win the nomination, this brand new Republican political party. Number one was former New York governor um, and Senator William Seward. William Seward was a hardcore abolitionist, and his handlers told him, look, when you go out there, just read the teleprompter. Kind of like one of those Joe Biden things, right? <laughs> don't, don't improvise, don't get on a tangent, just read what we put up there, all right? St stick to that. And he goes out there and is like, well, I'm William Seward, and I want to be president, and I want to keep the country together, but boy, I really want to just get rid of slavery. I hate slavery. Abolition. And they're like, oh my God, what did you just do? So he's done. Next guy that is nominated is the Secretary of the Treasury from Ohio, a guy named Salmon Chase from Chase Bank. Word on him was that he was so corrupt, the only thing he wouldn't steal was a red hot stove. All right. Next guy, um, Edward Cameron, had some bad business dealings, and so they don't know what to do. These are the three heavyweights, and they keep going around, and they go, and they go to round two, and they're like, you know, how are we going to get people to, to agree on someone? And they look at the nominations, and everybody across the board had either Chase, Cameron, or Seward on their ticket, but in the number two spot, Everybody had this guy named Lincoln. Who's that? That's the guy that was debating Stephen Douglas. No way! That guy, and they look around, and it was almost unanimous. He was everybody's number two choice. So Seward, Cameron, and Chase are brought in the, you know, honest to goodness, political back room and say, look guys, this is what we're going to do. We're going to nominate Abraham Lincoln. What? Why are we going to do that? Well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to nominate Lincoln. And you guys are going to fill his cabinet positions. He's some dumb, stupid hayseed from Illinois. The country might go to war. So he will be the puppet. You will pull the marionette strings. If anything goes wrong, you can blame it on him and keep your hands clean and run again in 1864. All three guys agree to it. Abraham Lincoln is surprised to find out that he is now the Republican nominee to be President of the United States. Like, Hello, all right. Well, if I'm going to win an election, you might as well go big. When the southern states find out that he is the one nominated, they go crazy. They go, no, that man is going to destroy slavery. And he will say time and time again, no, my job is to preserve the Union. So there are no ballots cast for him in 10 of what will be the southern states or the neutral states. He doesn't even appear on the ballot. When he wins the election with only 40% of the vote, it was still a clear and away majority, South Carolina is the first, always South Carolina, they're the first state to secede, followed by, very quickly, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, in Florida. And so now the country has divided. And here comes the worst day ever. I, you know, this may be a little bit too, too detailed. Um, but Lincoln gets his dream job. In Chicago, one, his oldest son dies. So they've got to leave behind their oldest child. And his wife falls into a depression. She's moving away from the only home she's ever known, leaving a child behind, and they're en route to a new city. On the way there, an assassination plot is uncovered that people were going to kill President Lincoln while he stopped in Washington to give a speech for Washington's birthday. This is in February, around this time of year. When that happens, a decision is made that the family is going to go by one train to Washington. Lincoln was going to dress in disguise and go a very different route. So he gets into town about 4.30 a.m. Problem is, he was supposed to get there ahead of his family, but because the president was now on a train, they had to alter the routes of other trains, and it takes time, and his family beats him to Washington. Well, the press was waiting. And as Lincoln moves into Washington in disguise, 
He's drawn as a little rat with a big Abraham Lincoln beard scurrying through the sewers saying, what type of president do we have who's so cowardly he hides from assassins while sends his family on ahead? His first day in the White House, and that's what he sees on the front page. He's like, oh my God, this was supposed to be the, my, the greatest job ever. This isn't going well. Hey. You have your inauguration speech ready. Well, when am I given that? Oh, about 10 o'clock this morning. What? I just got here. Can I, like, get a nap, get some breakfast, get a shower? And here is where Lincoln's decision-making really shines through. Um, as he talks about <clears throat> what he's going to do, Fort Sumter is under siege. The outgoing president, James Buchanan, is known as the do-nothing president. So... He has just left a group of soldiers down in Fort Sumter doing nothing for them. The Confederate states are beginning to take and seize federal forts in the South. And you got to mention, he's got to be emotional, he's tired, he's a little angry, and he gets up and he gives this language about what I'm going to do is preserve the Union. What I'm going to do is to hold, to occupy, and possess all federal institutions currently in the southern United States. He never, ever refers to the Confederacy as the Confederacy. He intentionally calls them the southern United States. So this goes to how smart he was, because if he recognizes a separate power, then the Confederate States, as a foreign nation, could seek allies. They could get money, they could get weapons, and they could get soldiers from England and France. But when he doesn't recognize their legitimate existence, if England and France helps the southern United States, it's an act of war. Does it on the very first day of his job under tremendous stress. When that's done, he comes back in, Still hasn't unpacked his suitcase, and he's told by his Secretary of State, Mr. William Seward, that a man wants to meet him. Who wants to meet me? Oh, it is the Vice President of the Confederacy, a man named Alexander Stevens. He's like, I don't recognize anybody by that name. Now, in fact, Alexander Stevens, when Lincoln served a partial term as a representative, was Lincoln's best friend. Two guys loved each other. That's why Alexander Stevens was sent from Richmond to negotiate with Lincoln. Like, huh? I don't know who that is. Well, yeah, it's Alexander Stevens, vice president of the Confederacy. Well, what's that? Well, just meet with him. And Lincoln's like, no, I'm not. Whoever that man is, usher him out of my house. I have business to attend to. <clears throat> but Abraham, it's, it's Alex. Did you not hear what I said, Secretary Seward? Remove him from the house. And Seward believing that he's the man in charge, will meet with Alexander Stevens in a side office and says, look, Abe's a little tired, he's a little emotional. You go down and tell Governor Pickens of South Carolina that I'll have Abraham remove those soldiers. Don't you worry about it. I'll take care of it. And Alexander Stevens goes off. And later on, uh, Lincoln is having his first cabinet meeting, same day, and he's like, okay, what are some options? How are we going to deal with Fort Sumter? Anybody have any, any ideas? Seward says, oh, I don't worry about it. I, I've taken care of it. Well, what do, you, what do you mean you took care of it? Did you explain to me how you took care of it? Well, look, when you went me with Alexander Stevens, I figured I would help you out. So I told him to tell Governor Pickens and Jefferson Davis that I was going to have you remove the soldiers from Fort Sumter. <laughs> you did what? I said, well, you know, I told him that I would have you get the soldiers out of Fort Sumter. So you met with Alexander Stevens. Well, yeah. I mean, he's the Vice President of the Confederacy. And Lincoln usually had a very good grip on his temper, but he blows his stack. He's like, I thought you had a brain in your head. I thought you were a lawyer. Did you not hear what I said this morning? We would hold, occupy, and possess 
everything in the southern United States. I didn't want to meet with Alexander Stevens. I know exactly who he is. But when a member of this government recognizes them, it legitimizes their existence. What you just did, he just blows his top sergeant in the land and just goes off. And Seward's sitting there going like, oh. You can imagine tall, angry, six foot five guy just yelling at you. You just might have started a war we can't win. What are you, stupid? And he ends with, you may think you're the president, Secretary Seward, but I am the president. You're fired. Get out. Well, you can't fire me. Well, actually, I just did. Now, by the end of the war, you know, Seward, Seward is back. But at that moment in time, people realized, wait a minute. He did something intentional. He didn't call him the Confederacy. He didn't meet with his best friend because he had it in his mind all the time. Maybe this guy isn't such a moron. And maybe he's not a pushover. Maybe he's not a, a puppet that we're going to be able to move around. This guy is an independent thinker and a man of action. Very first day on the job, with the country dissolving around him, he handles several major crises. No one. No one in the country at, or presidency has ever experienced more problems from the very first day of their presidency than Abraham Lincoln. And here's where he realizes, this is from um, the movie, that his wife he can't confide in Mary Todd because she's emotionally upset due to the loss of their son. He's in a job that he realizes half the people didn't even want him in. And the people he was supposed to rely on for counsel and advice don't want him to have the job. So he finds out he is the loneliest guy ever. The only one he had to rely on is himself. And it's going to go that way throughout the war. He didn't have a sounding board. He didn't have a shoulder to cry on. He had, when did he have a good day, if you think about it? <laughs> that went well, all right? Maybe, maybe the afternoon of July the 3rd, 1863, when Vicksburg and Gettysburg. But other than that, my man did not have a good day, and yet he keeps going. Hours and hours and hours every single day. Um, so, um, he'll handle Fort Sumter by sent, telling Governor Pickens, I'm sending a train full of food. You can stop it. You can inspect it. You can do whatever you want to it. But if you fire on it, or if you prevent the food going to my soldiers, it is you who will be responsible and not I. So he goes, okay, chess move, check, you know, you know checkmate, what are you going to do? If you are the aggressor, if the shots are fired, it's going to be your fault, not mine. Next move is yours, Jefferson Davis, Governor Pickens. What do you do? But when he calls 75,000 soldiers to... To go down and recapture the fort, that is seen as the federal um, in, invasion. And that happens, Virginia, Tennessee, Arkansas, and North Carolina vote to secede. One of the neutral states was Baltimore, or Maryland. And the people in Maryland, you know, Baltimore, I'm a Steeler fan, I hate Baltimore. <laughs> all right. All right. As the new recruits are marching through town, and only in Baltimore would like the, the train lines stop, you have to march a half mile through town to get on another rail line to keep going south. In that half mile march, people are yelling and, and throwing rocks and bottles at the soldiers. And there were a group of professional thugs, I call them the Ravens. But at the time, <laughs> uh, they were called the Plug Uglies, uh, begin to attack the very raw recruit Union soldiers, and someone shoots a gun. And it kicks off a riot where 12 people are shot or bayoneted in this running gun battle through the streets of, of Baltimore. So people begin to attack the rail lines through um, the city, the telegraph line, so Washington can't communicate. So he pulls something out of his hat, and I'm going to speed up his stories here. He um, <clears throat> momentarily, using executive authority, he declares martial law in Baltimore. And what he did was he removed the writ of habeas corpus, which going back to old Roman law 
You know, we got some lawyers in the room. You've got to have the body. You've got to have evidence for a crime. You can't just accuse somebody of something. Within 24 hours, they have to be charged. Lincoln removes that. They're like, well, you can't do that. He's like, well, actually, I can. And the problem was, Maryland was going to vote to secede. And he's like, if they secede, I am trapped. And there were nine influential guys that were the rabble-rousers of the Maryland General Assembly. So he sends the army up there, and he goes, I want you to arrest those nine guys for a couple days. Well, what are we going to charge them with? I don't care, all right? Don't charge them. Make something up, but throw them in the clink for three days. Benjamin Butler goes up there, and they arrest the nine guys. One of them is a guy named John Merriman. John Merriman happened to be the nephew of the sitting Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, Roger Taney. Taney hears of this and goes crazy. Because here's a writ of habeas corpus. You have to tell me why my nephew's in jail. And General Benjamin Butler says, well, I don't have to tell you anything. Yes, I do. I'm Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Well, I work for the president. His name's Lincoln. You're not him, so I don't care. So Taney goes berserk. And he very subtly calls for a joint meeting of Congress that he, the Chief Justice, wants to address the House of Representatives and the Senate. <clears throat> very, very, very infrequently happens. <coughs> and on the morning of the meeting, he says that Lincoln should be impeached. Because this man has violated the law, it is unconstitutional, we have to impeach him and get rid of him. Does anybody have any words in his defense? And over in the back, no one saw him. Standing in the back of the room, leaning against the pillar, was a guy who said, well, I've got a few things to say. And it was the president. They're like, oh my god, how did you get here? And perfect Lincoln, he goes, well, I walked out my back door and I turned left. <laughs> And he's like, i got a couple things to say. He's like, Mr. Tawney, he says something, and here is the brilliance of Lincoln. I'm going to read you this quote because it's, it's so wonky, and I'll explain it. He says, Justice Tawney, or all laws of the country were to go, un excuse me, <clears throat> were all laws but one were to go unexecuted, and the government itself go to pieces, lest that one be violated. He's like, ah, just hang on. Where all laws but one were to go unexecuted, and the country itself go to pieces, lest that one be violated. I have any, no idea what you're saying, President Lincoln. He's like, well, you're so worried about one tiny, minute little law. If you were so worried about laws being violated, why did you say nothing when Fort Sumter was surrounded? Why did you say nothing when the South formed a confederacy. I'm sure laws were broken. You didn't care about them, but you're worried about this tiny little one. So let me drop some knowledge on you, sir. And this is great, Lincoln. He goes, I've been known to do a little bit of lawyering myself. All right? <laughs> he goes, the Constitution says that the writ of habeas corpus can be revoked if there is a threatened invasion, if the country's facing a rebellion, or in the threat of public safety. Well, let me see. Soldiers were fired upon in Fort Sumter. That's invasion. All right. There's a rebellion. United States federal troops were attacked in Baltimore. And nine civilians were bayoneted and shot. So I move that not just one of the reasons the Constitution says the writ can be suspended, but all three. Nor does it say which branch of government can remove them. So I say all three can do it. Do you have any questions? And Tony was like, <sighs> and he walks away. Now, did Lincoln push the envelope? Yes. But presidents in time of war, if you're going to push the envelope, that is the time to do it. So Lincoln handles a constitutional crisis, again, within his own government. And the war hasn't even really gotten started. Um, he will teach himself battle tactics by going literally by himself to the Library of Congress and, er, yeah, and checks out a book, The Elements of Military Arts and Science. In the meantime, 
Um, there is the Trent Affair, where two Confederates snuck out trying to get British allies. Lincoln has their ship fired upon. It is boarded, the two men are arrested, and brought to Washington. And the Queen in England goes crazy. How dare you fire on one of my ships? How dare you board it, you American ruffians? And she threatens an invasion from Canada. You're not only going to fight the Confederacy, but you're going to fight me as well. And the Queen's husband, Prince Albert, says, Dear, hang on a little bit. This is what I need to tell you. We've been selling like boats and items to the Confederacy, but I've been selling gunpowder to President Lincoln. You've been doing what? He's like, oh yeah, thought we could make a little money. So do we really want to go to war with them? She's like, well, we've got to do something. All of a sudden, she gets a message from Lincoln that says, look, that's what we're going to do. My country is in some trouble. We've got a short memory. If you can wait three months, I will release Mason and Slidell. I will put them on my fastest ship, and they will go directly to you. You can go to Parliament and the British government and say, I told that idiot Lincoln what for, and he released the men. But a couple months will buy me time to say, I told that old powder wig wearing hag where to stick it, and I can keep my job over here you can look good in front of your people. What do you say? Very quickly, very deftly, very easily, the queen agrees, and Lincoln has just solved his second or third interna international crisis. Again, he's doing all of this by himself. And so, um, to speed him up, um, John Erickson, um, several years ago, if you remember when the Panthers were a brand new team, Panther Stadium was called Erickson Stadium after the um, uh, technology giant. Well, this is the guy that started it all. He was a shipmaker in New York, and he will build on the walls over there and over here. He's the guy who will design and build the USS Monitor, the first all-iron battleship. Problem is the government owed him $250,000 from a previous job, and they didn't pay him. And so when Lincoln says, look, the, the Confederates have got this thing called the Merrimack slash, slash Virginia, I need a metal ship, can you help us? Everyone he sent, Erickson said no to. And Lincoln writes him a letter and says, dear Mr. Erickson, I'm sorry that my predecessors have wronged you. I don't know what they did, but we are in a time of crisis. I don't know how, but I will get you that $250,000, even if I have to pay it out of my own pocket. But right now, I hear that you're a really smart guy. We could really use your help. You have an unlimited budget. Buy whatever materials you need and have the bill sent to me. Sincerely yours, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States. Erickson says, man, I got a letter from the President. Not only am I going to get 250000 imagine that in 1861. That's a nice hunk of money. Plus, I get to use my creative genius with an unlimited budget. John Erickson revolutionizes naval warfare forever as the days of the wooden battleship are gone. As soon as the Merrimack crashes through the Union Navy um, in Chesapeake Bay, Hampton Roads, and the Monitor sails up, the two bang away at each other all day, neither one of them is, is sunk. Both metal ships are impervious to traditional methods of, of warfare. So Lincoln has a hand in changing the way naval warfare is going to be fought way back in 1861. The war is incredible. And there are so many decisions during the war, we would be here all night. But here is Abraham Lincoln. He sends in John McDowell, who's supposed to win, and gets beat at First Bull Run, Manassas. Then he hires a really smart guy named George McClellan who's supposed to win, and he somehow, when victory is in his hand, still loses. We're still not sure how. Then he gets another guy named John Pope. He gets beat even worse at Manassas, Virginia. 
And I think one of the most incredible decisions Lincoln ever made is picking his fourth commander of the Union Army. Anybody know who the fourth one is? Some of you should know. Not quite great. There was a guy that just thought he was the most awesome thing in the world. His ego was so enormous, he made the Greek god Narcissus look like, you know, uh, you know a, a, a wimp. And the army loved this guy. But man, whenever he had a chance to do something right, he would find a way to drop the ball. The guy is George McClellan. It was number two. Number two is reinstated. Number two, George McClellan called Lincoln the original gorilla. All right? To Mr. President, you're nothing but the original gorilla. You're an idiot. I don't even want to listen to you. But McClellan is the one guy the Union Army loved at this point. Now, they didn't win, but very few of them died in their losses. Robert E. Lee was 20 miles from Washington, D.C., the Union Army was tromping back into Washington, dispirited, beaten once again. And everyone says, look, you got to get somebody new. And Lincoln says, no. The only guy that can resurrect the Union Army in this time of crisis is George McClellan. What? McClellan? He's insubordinate. He hates you. Just when he's about to win, he turns around and you can't do it. Everyone told Lincoln he was crazy. And he goes, well, if I'm wrong, it's my fault. He reinstates McClellan. McClellan wins the Battle of Antietam. And that was, was crucial. Because if Robert E. Lee had won at Antietam, the British government had said they were going to recognize the Confederacy. So Lincoln literally, what's the gambling phrase, all in, he puts every chip he had on the table risking something that he dared not lose in order to win what he had to have. And the only guy that he thought that could do it was George McClellan. And he's right. Union Army wins. England backs off. Lincoln has to fire McClellan shortly after that. All right. yeah. He was good for like 72 hours. Then he goes to Ambrose Burnside, horrible decision, Fredericksburg, Mary Washington, you know, take a right down the road next time you guys are up there, make her give you a tour. Um, let's see, where am I at? Ambrose Burnside. Uh, then we go to, I have this mind blanked, Ambrose Burnside. Oh, Joe Hooker to George Meade. And finally, number eight is Ulysses Grant. People had tried to fire Grant several times. Lincoln always said, no, I can't fire this guy. He's the only one that I have that, like, wins. And in 1864, when Grant is called to Washington, Lincoln said, he's probably the guy that's going to defeat me in the presidential election. I'm a Republican. Grant's a Democrat. So he had the fortitude to know, here's the guy that's going to win the war, even though he's probably going to take my job. So, um, oh, where are we here? Um, at the Battle of Antietam, Lincoln again um, pops out the Emancipation Proclamation. What I say about that is, in order to do something as earth-shattering as declaring <coughs> slavery illegal in the midst of a war, You've got to have a firm foundation to stand on. You're going to take shots. You can't do it when you're getting your tail whipped. So as soon as McClellan wins at Antietam, the emancipation is proclaimed, and the Civil War is turned into a war against slavery. But um, he fights one more public battle over the, the Civil War, and that is Horace Greeley who, one, is a huge newspaper man, loved Lincoln early on, and now has become a radical abolitionist. He says, you, Lincoln, it is you who are letting slavery exist. Your slowness to act, this is all your fault. I speak for all 21 million people in the Union. Do your job. And Lincoln's like, really? My cabinet hates me. Second child has died. My wife has now gone completely bonkers. I, my generals suck, 
all right? I can't win no matter what I do. And now i got to deal with this. Really? You know, can someone give me some help here? And Lincoln responds by saying, Mr. Greeley, my paramount objective is to save the Union. It is not to either destroy or preserve the institution of slavery. If I can win this war and preserve the Union by freeing all the slaves, I'll do it. If I can preserve the Union by keeping all the slaves in slavery, I'll do that too. If I can do it by freeing some and leaving others enslaved, I'll do that as well. I will do whatever it takes. What else do you want me to do? And Greeley was like... Lincoln was a master of saying what he was going to do to by responding and leaving you nowhere to go. Like, look, all the slaves, slavery, all the slaves freed, some slave. Those are all the possible options I have. So he backs off on Horace Greeley, and in the Gettysburg Address, he gives probably the most, one of the most quoted speeches in American history. It's right back here when he talks about four score and seven years ago. You know? It's like, look at where we are. All right? Anybody know how much a score is? 20 years. All right. you know, look, 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 look at what we've done. Look at, look at where we are. And the problem with this, he gives a 270-word speech in just over two minutes. All right? Most people can quote at least part of it. He was the seventh speaker. He, they didn't even want to invite him when Gettysburg was christened as a national battlefield. First speaker spoke for two and a half hours. It was a cold, cold, rainy November day. People were getting up to leave. They were like, oh, and by the way, we got the president. He's going to say a few words. And as he begins talking, people are like, oh, wait a minute. That's really good. So people thought he was done um, at, at that point in time. Um, here's a picture of it. And I was showing it earlier. Lincoln is, where is he? So here he is right here. All right, he's in the general population. Imagine President Obama just sitting by a group of guys, not even up on the stage, just kind of thrust in. They're like, here you go. He's good to get up and say something. So Matt's speech um, was just incredible. It speaks to... Uh, his mindset. All right, it's 7:50, so I'm going to um, speed up. Um, Lincoln will always say that when the Confederacy wanted to talk peace terms, he said, "No, it's unconditional surrender. We're going to make you quit one way um, or the other." Um, as Grant's siege of Petersburg and the war is beginning to enter its final phase. Lincoln believes he's going to lose the election of 1864. And he says, I will fully cooperate with the next administration. There will be a very peaceful transfer of power. And, and he was looking at it. There had been no two-term presidents for almost 40 years. But no president had not been re-elected in a time of war. So Lincoln is going to tip that scale one way or the other. His opponent is none other than George McClellan. He's back. <laughs> and McClellan believes he's going to win because the soldiers, the Union Army, is going to vote for him. Soldiers were not allowed to vote for the president at this time because he was their boss. But Grant says, no, if anybody has a right to choose the president, it's the guys getting shot at. 87% of the soldiers will vote for Abraham Lincoln. His second election is he wins by a landslide. People want him to finish the job. And here is the, the, another, the quote, March 4th, 1864, that, that he gives when he talks about the end of the war. And he's the one guy that could have made it happen with malice toward none, with charity for all. So when this is over, 